episode of The Savvy Entrepreneur. Today we have a very important topic for you, mental health. We will be discussing how COVID-19 self-distancing and self-quarantining can impact your mental health. And to have this conversation, I've invited one of my very good friends, Dr. Kimberly Claggett. Kim, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, and yourself? I'm doing best as I can, uh, you know, with the self-distancing and everything. Um, I appreciate you taking the time to join me from your home in Los Angeles. How's, how's everything in LA? Uh, you know what's interesting? Um, I live in downtown LA and it's basically a ghost town around here. Um, there's a lot of restaurants, hotels, um, you know, financial businesses, uh, entertainment venues, and they basically seem to have all closed down. Um, so it's, it's different here. Um, we also found out that there's the first confirmed case in Skid Row, um, which has a lot of people nervous. It's a, one, just a very vulnerable population. They don't have a lot of resources to not only protect themselves, but to prevent the spread of this virus. So um, I think people are concerned about the, the effects now that it's in that community and how it will affect us all. But we're holding up. Yeah, that, that's scary. Um, people who have uh, limited resources or no resources um, are a affected class that is often forgotten. Yeah. Um, you know, um, I, I myself have been uh, self-quarantining for a few weeks now. And uh, one of the things I shared with my patients before I left was the fact that most of us will be okay. However, not all of us will be. And we have a responsibility, those of us that are in positions to, to isolate, um, you know, to even basic things like wash our hands more often. We need to be doing that for the people that, that can't do it themselves or for the people that we know won't be or think won't be okay. Um, because there's a lot of people that don't have, um, they don't, they're not lucky enough to, to really be confident that they're going to get through it. Scary. So Kim, can you tell us a little bit more about your background and uh, tell us what you're doing uh, and how that is important to this discussion? Um, so um, I currently I work for the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. I am a psychologist or mental health clinician within there. Um, I have my uh, PhD in uh, clinical forensic psychology. My emphasis was in victimology, which looks a lot at the effects of um, trauma um, on people's mental well-being. Um, let's see. Um, as part of my duties at work, I do work with the inmates in the prison. Um, I, my specific population is, um, a little bit higher functioning. They tend to be people with depressive disorders, anxiety disorders, personality disorders. Um, a lot of them, um, uh, suffer from trauma in their background. Um, and a lot of them, a lot of their mental health issues didn't come up really until, or they didn't realize it until they were incarcerated. And I think part of it is because the effects of the isolation just exacerbated the symptoms that were already there, or in some cases, created them. Um, I do a lot of uh, suicide and a uh, crisis intervention, and I am a trainer for uh, suicide prevention and safety planning interventions. All those things are super relevant today, especially since everyone is basically in isolation. Um, do you want to talk about how isolation can impact uh, an individual psyche? Yeah, of course. Um, we, I think we can all learn a lot about um, the effects of isolation by looking at the 
prisoner population in the United States. There is a lot of research demonstrating how isolation is actually really bad for people's mental wellness. Um, if you look at people that have been kept in complete isolation or in uh, like segregated housing, we can see that over time they tend to develop more and more mental health issues. Um, it's it's very easy for to, to recognize how it can affect your depression and anxiety, but over long periods of time it can have even more um, negative effects, um, increased paranoia. Um, with some people even going as far as like delusional type disorders. Um, uh, and, and then over time also increasing suicide risk as well. Wow. So with this self-isolation, people are experiencing things some have never experienced before. Most people haven't been forced to reside in their homes 24 hours a day. So. For those who maybe don't realize that this is impacting them, what are some of the things that they should look out for to say to show that they are maybe experiencing some depression or other type of um, mental illness? So with depression, we often think of it as people feeling sad. And that is definitely one of the symptoms but it's not the only symptom, and sometimes people don't even realize that they haven't connected, that they're feeling sad. I recommend that people look for changes in their just their baseline level of functioning. So if you're seeing things like you're suddenly sleeping a whole lot more or a whole lot less, which I get it is hard right now because a lot of people are sleeping more than usual, but paying attention to see if it's something, um, if it's something more than that. If you're, for example, not able to sleep because you can't get your mind to turn off and you're constantly worrying about what's going to happen tomorrow or next week or from now. Um, or if you find yourself staying in bed and you're just saying like, I don't really, I don't feel like getting up. I don't have a reason to get up. That can be a sign. Um, if you no longer want to do things that used to be of interest to you, if you like cooking and suddenly you don't want to, if you're finding yourself withdrawing from people, um, you know, not answering phone calls, not res return, uh, responding to text messages, things like that can be an indication that you, that you're, you know, starting to go down that path. Um, if uh, thoughts of suicide, if that, if that starts crossing your mind, um, it doesn't mean you're at high risk, but if you suddenly think like, you know, I'm not going to make it through this, or I, I lost my job, maybe I'd just be better off dead, those kind of things um, can be a sign of depression. Yeah, that's really scary. Faces and eating patterns is a big one as well. Um, oftentimes people that get depressed will eat a lot to help them feel better, and they'll notice that they start gaining weight or just eating way more than normal. Um, and then on the other hand, some people eat a lot less. They feel like they're they're sick if they eat, or they just don't have an appetite and don't want to eat. Um, so that is, that's a big risk factor um, or warning sign. And um, increased drinking, um, drug use, something like that, because a lot of times that helps people cope. They can't necessarily think it. They can't say, I feel depressed right now, but they know that they feel better if they're under the influence and they don't necessarily have to think about it. Self-medicating. Yeah. So if you happen to have someone in, in your life, a friend or family member who might be exhibiting some of these symptoms, what should you do as a, as a concerned friend or relative? I think the best thing that we can all do right now is is just reach out and be present for that person. You don't have to give them advice. You don't have to cure anything. You don't have to tell them what to do. But just being there and being an active person in their life is, is really helpful. When we do safety planning interventions for um, patients that are a higher risk for suicide, one of the things we do is 
identify people in your life that you you can just talk to. You don't have to tell them you're depressed. You don't have to tell them that you know you're anxious or you're having these negative thoughts. But just people that you feel comfortable just you know talking about sports, talking about TV, um, whatever it might be. Um, the other thing I think is really important is to really validate the way that they're feeling if they do open up to you. Um, there, there still is a big stigma against mental health, or mental illness, and mental health treatment here in the United States. And a lot of people see having depression or having anxiety, having suicidal thoughts as a sign of weakness. And therefore, people feel uncomfortable really opening up about it. Um, I, I recently just just like an hour ago, read an article that said four in 10 Americans have either lost job or lost a chunk of their income already because of this, this um, virus. Um, and that nearly half of all the respondents in the survey, which was done by Kaiser, um, have said that stress related to this is taking a toll on their mental health. Um, and that's just the people that can identify that they're having these issues. And if you think about it, it's been at most maybe four to five weeks for some people. And we have a substantially longer time that we may be going through this. So we can see those, we'll likely see those numbers increase. Um, so when you're hearing people say things like that, validating that for them, letting them know that it's, it's okay, it's normal, and there's nothing wrong with them because they feel this way. Um, I think feedback is always nice, if, but when you give feedback, you have to make sure that you're doing it in a really caring, empathic way. Uh, a lot of people that are already feeling depressed and anxious already have negative thoughts about themselves. So if you, when you're talking to them, are giving feedback that maybe sounds accusatory or uh, blamey, that can reinforce those ideas of, as well. That's a great point. You don't have to fix them. You, I mean, most people are medical professionals, so I love the feedback you gave about just listening and being there for them, showing them that there's people that who care about them and who are, you know, there. It's great advice. So let's say you're the person that maybe is depressed or maybe you don't even know that you're depressed. Do you have some tips and tricks that you can offer our audience about things that they can do to uh, optimize their mental capacity and mental health? So there's a few different ways that you can manage these symptoms. I think first and foremost, if there's something you can do, you can do to address the situation that's causing you to feel anxious or depressed, then you should make some attempts to address them. Um, avoidance is great for coping, especially when you're in kind of a crisis moment, but it doesn't solve the issue. And therefore, you know, later down the road, the next day, a couple hours from now, that's going to come back up. So if you're anxious, say, because um, you lost your job, and, and that's, you know, then causing some more depression, you can do things to help your employment. So maybe revamping your resume. Um, even if you're not applying for jobs, maybe you can look at some jobs. If you can take an online course or thing that may make you, like, increase your employability, that would be um, nice because you're tackling the problem directly. Uh, that's not always an option, though. And... And some of what we're dealing with right now, we can't tackle directly. The, there's so much unknown. We don't know how much longer we're going to be in quarantine. We don't know the, you know, the complete pool of job losses, what that's going to look like. Um, we don't know if we're going to get sick. We don't know if our family members are going to get sick. Um, and so a lot of that is, is, causing an increase in symptoms just because there's so much fear and unknown with it. So in situations like that, I find distraction techniques really helpful, especially when you're in the moment where you can't get your mind off of it. So listening to music, um, reading a book, 
Some people find TV to be helpful. Some people find it to be the exact opposite because you can have it on and you're, and you're still in your head. So sometimes that doesn't work. I personally find, and a lot of my patients find puzzles to be really helpful because you have to really focus on like word searches or Sudoku puzzles. You can't, you know, put all these numbers together and still think of everything that's happening in the world. So it really pulls you out of that. Um, another great thing to do is, you know, remember that our, our mind and our body are very connected. And there's a lot of research that says healthy diet and exercise is more for mental wellness than uh, medications do. So first and foremost, really just taking care of your body, making sure you're getting enough sleep, making sure you're drinking plenty of water. Um, if you're able to get into your yard and get a little movement, that's great, especially because sunlight, you know, really helps your mood as well. Um, break a little sweat. We love to eat junk food right now, but if you can put a little bit of a hold on that and make sure you're getting your fresh fruits and vegetables, protein, and that your, bal your diet is somewhat balanced, all of that's going to help you. Um, I think another thing is that a lot of research also shows the best way to make yourself feel better is to do something positive for someone else. So we all have our various blessings in different ways. Some people are lucky to, you know, to be in a situation where they can self-quarantine and not have to worry about paying rent. Some people are um, lucky that their job is giving them time off. Some people are lucky that they have family support. Um, some people just have, have a, an ability to talk to people and make them smile. Um, we all have these various gifts and we can give back in numerous ways. And at the end of the day, remember if you are self-quarantining that your actions are literally saving lives. And when you're feeling down and you're feeling like it's rough, reminding yourself of that. There is a purpose to this sacrifice. That's a great point. It's all in perspective. We're doing this to save lives and hopefully, you know, it works. I've seen, you know, news reporting talking about up to 300,000 deaths. And I, you know, luckily we haven't realized that yet, but I can only imagine the mental toll it'll have on people. Even in New York, they're having these refrigerated trucks for the deceased. Uh, do you have any tips or ideas on how people can help cope with the impending death of hundreds of thousands of people? We are definitely in an unprecedented time with the amount of death we could possibly encounter. Um, most of us haven't experienced that in our lifetime. Um, and then in addition to that, because of how contagious this virus is, it's really changing our ability to um, to breathe, to get closure in the ways that we usually do. Um, we're not able to sit with our sick family members in the hospital right now. Um, a lot of times not even having an opportunity to say your final goodbyes. Um, not being able to go to funerals because of you know, limiting mass gatherings. I think this is something that um, will also very much kind of resemble what grieving is like in prison. And so a lot of times there is this initial grief when you experience that loss and, and you hear the news and you find out that that person is no longer with you. And that's hard and that's difficult. But then when life resumes, when, it, when the prisoners are released from, from jail or prison or in our situation, when these, these quarantines are lifted and we're able to go back to work and get back to our normal lives, that grief will hit again because you realize that life is going back to normal, but it's going back to normal without those people that we've lost. And you are, will likely have a whole flood of new emotions as we're trying to navigate this new ground with, without important people. Um, and knowing the, the population that it's 
particularly bad for, which is the elderly, it's it's going to be people that have helped us to have these things in the past. I think one of the things that we can really do right now is just remind ourselves that it's okay to feel however you're feeling. With grief, you're going to have all kinds of emotions. You're going to be angry. Angry that you didn't get to say your goodbyes. Angry that you didn't get to have the funeral. Um, there, I, I wouldn't be surprised if there was a lot of survivor's guilt. Um, maybe shame that you weren't able to do more. Um, there's going to be the obvious depression involved. And what we know about grief is that there are days when you will get hit with all of those emotions and it'll feel like a tidal wave hitting you and you are drowning in your, in your emotions and you can't catch your breath. And then there are days, there'll be days when you feel a little bit better. And over time, hopefully it gets better, but there will be triggers. There will be, there will be dates. There will be reminders that, that we've experienced all of this loss. And it's not just a loss for the individual. It's at this point because it, it's so far reaching. It's a collective loss for everybody in our community, in, in our country, in the world. We're going through this together. So reminding yourself that it's okay to feel how you feel and be kind to yourself. Don't, don't judge yourself. Don't treat yourself too harshly. Don't compare yourself to other people. Um, and, and give yourself a break. I said earlier that, you know, diet and exercise and, and music and puzzles can help take your mind off of this. But when you're going through a loss of this sort, sometimes you just need to take a step back and listen to your body. And, and that's okay. If you want to stay in bed for days, it's okay. If you want to eat a whole bunch because it makes you feel better, that's okay. But there, there will come a point when you have to, to ask yourself, how long is this? going to ask and am I okay to keep doing this or do I need to push myself a little bit more and it's such a personal question because everybody agrees differently and the time frame is different for everyone mm. that's okay yeah such an important message everyone goes through this differently and the message that it's okay is, is really profound um, it's really important and you know, because there's so many people who are being impacted by this, I mean, just the other day, it was so unfortunate, I heard someone committed suicide on the railroad tracks uh, a few blocks away from where I live here in Longmont. Um, do you wanna talk about uh, any other tips or tricks for dealing with suicide prevention or helping reaching and connecting with people who might be at risk? I, uh, I would again, First, I'd like to reiterate that having depression, anxiety, thoughts of suicide, um, past suicide attempts is not a sign of weakness at all. It is, it is normal. Um, most Americans go through at least one major depressive episode in their lifetime. Um, it's, it's not as widely talked about, but people experience um, and it's okay to reach out for help if you need it. It doesn't say anything bad about you because you're experiencing them. Um, we are also currently facing several um, triggers that increase suicide risk. A big one is the perception of a loss of social support. Um, and, I, and I wanted to reach a, to say the word perception because it's how the individual perceives these circumstances, not how you or I might see them. So someone might say, you know, I've lost everyone around me. And you're like, oh, you still have your husband or you still have your wife there. Or, you know, your family's okay. They're alive. They're just in a different state. Um, and we, we can make sense of it that way, but that's not how they're experiencing it. So a lot of this is based on their perception. So um, the perception of loss of social support is a big one. We are very social creatures. Um, our, our whole livelihood is basically dependent on how, how we interact with others, um, how we connect, uh, 
emotionally how we connect, even if people don't realize that that's happening, supporting one another through difficult times. And so when you feel like that is taken away from you, it it's one of those things that just just increases your risk. Another one that we should expect right around now is uh, the loss of jobs and uh, financially how that will affect people. We do know that during economic recession, there is an increase in um, completed suicides. And um, we are facing that on levels we never have before in this country. Uh, like I stated earlier, already they're saying four out of 10 uh, families have experienced a loss of job or a loss of income of some sort because of this. Uh, the, some people, and there's various ways why this will affect people, some people find a lot of meaning and purpose in their lives through the work that they do. Uh, some people, you know, find a lot of pride in being able to go to work. It's part of their identity and part of who they are, and that's lost. Uh, another part of it is the anxiety that comes up from not knowing how you're going to get by from day to day. How long is your savings going to last? Will you be able to pay rent, buy groceries? Are you going to end up homeless on the streets? Um, you know, and that sounds like it's it's going from zero to 60 really quick, but that's what anxiety does and depression does. It makes your thoughts race to the point where you can very clearly see, I lost my job to I'm living in a tent, and it, it just happens. Um, you can't, it's almost like you can't control it. They just move so fast. And so then people start to worry. They start to feel like they, they can't provide. Um, after the 2008 recession, we saw an increase in suicide in um, middle age, uh, middle, middle age and middle class um, white males. Um, I think in part because they were hit very hard by the recession. Um, and they also tended to be family providers. And so we know with um, one of the, the thoughts that people have with suicide is that people will be better off without me. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm no good anymore. And so if you can imagine for a, a home provider who can't do that, you know, what kind of toll must that take on his overall sense of self or her overall sense? Um, so, uh, recent losses is, a, is another risk factor. And we just talked about that. If there, you know, some estimates a quarter million people passing away is big. And, and how many families does that yeah. impact? Um, and so when we see people that have these increased risk factors, we do, uh, we do a safety plan, and it's to give them steps that they can follow step by step to help them as these, as these thoughts or as the depression starts to get worse. And so the first thing you want to do is, is acknowledge that it's there. Um, people that have experienced this in the past will kind of know their triggers. They know their warning signs. Um, and so it can be much easier for them to say, okay, I'm going down this road, um, but for people that have never experienced this before, it's going back to what we talked about in the beginning. Identify, are there changes in your behavior, changes in your mood um, that lead you to think you, you might be more depressed? And then with that, are you having thoughts of suicide, even if it's passing? Um, one thing that a doctor told me once was that Having those thoughts isn't necessarily bad. Again, they're very normal. Um, but it's a red flag. And it's something that you tell yourself, like, okay, I just need to pay attention a little bit more. Um, and so after that, once you identify that you, you might be going down this road, you want to start to implement something that can help distract you from it. So these are the things we were talking about, like listening to music, puzzles, working out. Um, things that you can do on your own. Um, and you want to make sure that there, there are things that you can actually do in this situation. So going to the movies isn't going to help, but maybe you can change that to watching 
a feel good movie on TV. Um, you're not going to be able to go to your favorite workout class, but maybe you can um, do some jumping jacks or push ups or squats or something in your living room. If that isn't helping, then you'll want to move on to the next step, which is to reach out to people that you're comfortable with, that you are happy when you talk to. Um, and you're you're not necessarily telling them that you're having these thoughts or you're feeling this way. You're just really talking to them for social purposes so that you can maybe laugh a little, um, check in on how they're doing so you're not so focused on yourself all the time. Um, talk about TV, talk about sports, whatever it may be. Um, if that doesn't work, then you're going to want to find people you can reach out to and let them know that you're struggling. So this has to be someone that you you trust. It doesn't necessarily have to be a best friend or a family member, um, and sometimes those can be the hardest people to talk to. So reaching out to someone that you trust their opinion and, and how they will respond, and you can let them know, I am feeling so good. I'm feeling so anxious. I'm having these thoughts that won't be like me. I'm panicking. Um, and see if you can get some help, or maybe they, they've been in similar situations. Sometimes it's just having someone to hear you out, and then it's, it's cathartic, and it's like a breath of, breath of fresh air that you were able to say all of that. If uh, you're still finding that these, these thoughts are not going away, um, then you'll want to reach out to a professional. Um, there are um, hotlines that you can call. At least in LA, and I've heard also for New York, the uh, mental health departments, the county mental health departments, are setting up services so they can do some uh, telehealth or phone, um, phone contacts with people. Almost every mental health provider that I know right now is either still going into the office and working, or they're doing telehealth appointments. Um, so reaching out to somebody that will be unbiased, non-judgmental, and a little more equipped than some of your you know, basic community people to help you really understand what's going on and how you can cope with it. Um, beyond that, um, if it's still not working, then we want to talk about implementing ways to really keep you safe. And a lot of times, this is where friends and family come in as well. One of the things you'll uh, want to do if you're really still having these thoughts and they're, they're strong, you feel like you might act on them, is, is a means restriction, which means pulling the things out of your home that you can use to harm yourself. So if you have firearms, um, you want to remove those. Um, if you have lots of over the counter medication or prescription medication, you can report it off. You want to start removing those. Um, obviously, we can't get rid of everything, but what we do know is that the harder you make it to act on those thoughts, the less likely it is that you will act on them. Um, and then you should also start considering um, going into a, a medical facility. So either calling 911 or taking yourself to an emergency room and letting them know, and being very clear, not we'll do that, telling them, I am here because I am depressed and these are the thoughts that I'm having and I don't, I no longer think I can keep myself safe. Wow. That is so important what you just shared with us. And I thank you for all those uh, suggestions. One thing that I also wanted to talk about is uh, relationships. I mean, sometimes people are stuck in the house with their significant other for more hours than they're used to. Uh, do you have any tips or, uh, ways to deal with uh, your spouse or significant other that may be getting on your nerves? <laughs> um, I am by no means a relationship expert, but I will say uh, from working with people that are in a 6 by 12 cell, two people, um, communication is key. Uh, letting each other know how you're thinking, how you're feeling, uh, you know, really, I think this is also a time when you get to learn each other's, like, pet peeves, uh, things that irritate each other, 
um, because you are, you're just basically on top of people. So community, um, like I said, letting you know what you're thinking, how you're feeling, if you're upset, if you need some space, if possible, find a way to get a little bit of space from each other every now and then. Um, you know, go, just go to different rooms, um, whatever it might be, working out at different times, something, because we, as much as we're talking about how we need each other, we also need our own time. And so that can be really important. Um, being really caring, forgiving, and understanding for the other person right now as well. As we've said, we all, we're all going to manage this crisis. Um, some people, you know, their depression might come out more as anger um, or agitation or being short fused or something like that. Some people just want to isolate more and don't want anything to do with anybody. Other people are like, I need you, I need you, I need you. And that can be extremely difficult if you're responding in different ways if you're stuck in the same household. So letting them understand as best as you can why it is that you're responding that way. Um, and, and that way, you guys can just adjust a little bit to support each other better. Um, and, and like I said, being really caring and forgiving um, because it's difficult for everyone. That is so important. Being patient with your significant other, being compassionate, understanding that this is tough on everyone. Um, that, those are lessons that uh, we should try to carry over after this whole thing is, is done with as well. Um, Dr. Clegg, I really appreciate your time in talking to us about all these very important issues. And to you in the audience, if you have a friend or family member who is a potential person who needs help or maybe is lonely, reach out to them, talk to them, engage with them. When we work together as a community, everyone benefits.